Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join us as we learn from area professors and teachers as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for today. Now, here is today's program. Good day to you all, and thanks for joining us in the Word once again. We're starting a new unit of study in uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. We get four wonderful lessons coming out of Romans, and Dr. Roberts and I are looking forward to the challenge. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Romans is not uh, an easy letter no, to teach it's... because it is so theologically deep and dense and rich. There are a lot of heavy thoughts within Romans, but they're good. Yeah, yeah well, they're indispensable. It's, yes. it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful challenge, so we're glad to be here. We're still in an overall uh, series of study called uh, Discipleship and Mission, mm -hmm. and here with these four lessons from Romans, we're turning our attention more to um, the basis of the Christian life and then the way in which we live out our faith in discipleship and mission. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's an important theme. Now, this, uh, since this is our first uh, lesson uh, for a, a long while from Romans, we probably ought to talk a little bit about, yes. about it. Yeah. Our author is Paul, of course. Paul wrote it to a church he hadn't been to. Yeah, and had, uh, had not founded right. and had never visited. But from, uh, from chapter 16, we learn... He knew a lot of people. He knows there. a lot of people. A lot of people moved yeah. back and forth to Rome, mm -hmm. which was kind of the, the heart of the empire and the capital. And so he seems to know lots and lots of fellow Christians there, mm -hmm. uh, even though he's never visited there himself. He has some very close friends there, mm -hmm. in fact. Um, we, we know who hand-wrote this letter, by the way. Paul yes. dictated it, right. a man named Tertius. Tertius puts his little two cents in there <laughs> yes. at the end of the book. So he, he signs it, the, the, right. the person who actually uh, wrote it down, the, the scribe. Uh, who took the letter at dictation. Uh, that, that was a pretty important role to it play was. back in those it days. Was, yes. um, they not only had to be have good handwriting on that kind of rough uh, papyrus, but uh, they, they had to understand what they were writing. That's true. And, and there's a lot of the, the faith of the, the amanuensis, the scribe, that shows up. Yeah. It's not just, I mean, yeah. they, as far as we know, they didn't have any kind of shorthand. Right. So in order to take dictation, uh -huh. they're having to put in there what they understand of what's being yeah. said. And, that's, and imagine having to write with old quill pens oh, on, yes. on papyrus that wasn't perfectly smooth. It had right. little ridges. And yeah. so um, it, it, it was a real skill, a real gift, and uh, a real gift to Paul that, mm -hmm. that somebody like that... Tertius, his name means third. Mm -hmm. So uh, Romans had a tendency to uh, number there. Yeah. Number. I'll never forget um, when I first came to Milligan College way, way back, I needed a barber in Johnson City, Tennessee, and I went to, to Primus D's. Is that right? I don't know if any of our <laughs> viewers uh, remember Primus D's or not, but his name means first. So right. he was the first child <laughs> in the family. Tertius was the third child. Well, um, let's get to the contents of Romans here. This longest of Paul's letters um, contains a, a summary and an overview of his understanding of the Christian faith and the nature of salvation. Yes, and, and apparently it was written on the third missionary journey mm -hmm. and, and was written about the same time as 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, Galatians, written to the to the churches of Galatia with the problems they had. Paul talked about their problems and then some of the theology that's there briefly in those few chapters of Galatians, mm -hmm. he expands in Romans right. and comes across some of the same themes but with much more depth. Yeah, uh, there, there's such a crisis, uh, there's such a problem in the Galatian churches that he deals with those themes in a problem-solving way there. Mm -hmm. But with Romans, where he, he doesn't know so much about the day-by-day -day tensions of that congregation, yeah. he's able to step back and take a, the broader view mm -hmm. that, that you're talking about. And, and as with several of the churches, there were issues of unity within the church. Mm -hmm. And at Rome, it seems that it was especially 
magnified between Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And that's partly the political history. The right. Romans had thrown all the Jews out of the city and then there was a change of emperor and they came back. Mm -hmm. But in the interim, it appears that the church may have become more Gentile than Jewish and there were conflicts. Yeah. Yeah, unlike in the early days of the church we meet in the book of Acts uh, back in Palestine where the Jews, Jewish Christians were in the majority and then the Gentiles were just few, yeah. it, it, is, it does appear to be the opposite there. Mm -hmm. So the question of the role um, that Jews play in the life of the church and in God's plan of salvation uh, is a real issue, both for Jews mm -hmm. and for, for Gentile Christians. Mm -hmm. And Paul wants to deal with that. So there is some disunity tension, but of a very different kind than we meet in Galatians or Ephesians or even First or Corinthians. First, First Corinthians. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things about this very carefully written letter is that he has kind of a thesis statement for us right at the beginning in chapter one. Right. He After, starts off his traditional grace and peace and mm -hmm. thanks for the people and so right. forth. Beautiful Thanksgiving. But then pretty quickly gets to a point of declaring what yeah. he believes. I'd like for our viewers to hear us read those words because we're going to hear a lot of words that are going to turn up very prominently in the lesson for today. Yes. Yes. So It's almost like he took those words and magnified them to did. today's chapter. He did. Uh, this is the thesis statement of Romans. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith quote from the prophet Habakkuk yes. there at the end. Yeah. Well, I'm sure our viewers heard, heard those key words, gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. salvation, faith, uh, the righteousness of God. That's a key phrase we're yes. going to be dealing with in this lesson. Yeah. And then those words come right out of the Habakkuk quote, mm -hmm. righteous and faith. So yeah. uh, Paul lays it right out. These are the key terms I'm going to talk about, yeah. and he uh, expands on it uh, yeah. throughout the letter. Yeah, the rest of chapter 1, he, he moves on to talk about sinfulness of people, and especially when people ought to be and, and clearly should be aware of the presence of God, and they've substituted all kinds of things mm -hmm. and moved from that into all lifestyles of, of degradation. Mm -hmm. But then chapter 2, mm -hmm. he goes on to say, but don't brag if you're Jewish mm -hmm. as if you're above that. You've got your problems. And he goes on to say that even though the Jews have the law, it's keeping the law that makes the difference, not just having the law. Mm -hmm. And that brings him to chapter 3, yeah. where the statement is made that we've all sinned. Right. So the first three chapters um, are Paul's attempt to lay out the need for salvation. Mm -hmm. And the need is sin. Mm -hmm. And he makes it very clear that both Jews and Gentiles have this need in spite of their, their different revelation and different relationship mm -hmm. that Jews and Gentiles have had with God throughout the centuries. He says Gentiles had creation. They should have, they should right. have known God and worshipped God, but yeah. they didn't. And the Jews had the law. They should have obeyed God, yeah. uh, but they didn't. Right. And <laughs> so, so no matter who you are, you're without excuse. Yes. Yeah, so all have sinned. And yes. uh, yeah. f as we're going to see in our lesson today, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it, it's right at this point in Romans where our lesson is today at the end of chapter 3 that Paul makes the transition into his second main point in Romans, which is, uh, if now we know we all have this need for salvation, mm -hmm. what is God's means of salvation? Mm -hmm. By what means did God save us? Mm -hmm. And so we're at a very important point in, in the book of Romans. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll read, uh, starting then in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Okay. But now, apart from the law, <clears throat> the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Okay, that's great. Well, there's a lot of important uh, terminology in there. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 21 starts with this phrase, apart from the law, meaning with, without the assistance of the law. Um, God's righteousness has been revealed. Mm -hmm. God's requirements may be revealed by the law, yeah. God's expectations, but, uh, but actually, and the need for righteousness may be demonstrated by the law, mm -hmm. the, the, the problem with sin. Mm -hmm. But the law can't overcome sin and right. bring about righteousness. And it's, it's the righteousness of, of God that the whole Old Testament has borne witness to through yeah. the history of Israel, he mentions the law and the prophets. And of course, the law would be the Torah, the first five books uh -huh. we call the books of Moses. The prophets to the Hebrews were both what we think of as prophets, yeah. but also the historical books. Right. They saw that as the former prophets, that is, lived out the word of God was seen through the history. Yeah. So, and uh, then the, the whole, vocal prophets. The whole period of Joshua and Judges. Um, the kings. Uh, and then David and Solomon and all the kings. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jews firmly believe that God's will and God's hand could be seen at work in human history mm -hmm. as well as conveyed through the mouths of people yeah. we call yeah. uh, so the, prophets. The, the entire Old Testament, they, of course the, the writings are not mentioned here, the, mm -hmm. but they simply illustrate what the law and the prophets declare. Yeah. The righteousness of God yeah. is evident. So Paul says that the Old Testament declared and revealed the righteousness of God, mm -hmm. even though it couldn't bring it about right. in, in our lives. So the law still then is very important. Yeah. Now, now, what about this word righteousness? We're, here we've been throwing it around, um, and we, we probably ought to attempt the definition of it. It's a big theological word. Yeah. yeah how, how are you used? To, uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You want to go first? Okay, now go ahead. That's... Um, well, uh, the concept um, can be translated either with the English word righteousness or the English word justification. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we see those, in fact, in this passage, sometimes it's the word justified and sometimes it's the word righteous. Yes. But those are two different English words translating the very same Greek word. Yeah, yeah so, so um, the idea of righteousness is to bring someone into a right relationship, in mm -hmm. this case, with God. Mm -hmm. So to, to bring about an alignment. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we've got computers to write essays now. Mm -hmm. When we were in college, we had to type things out. Yeah. And if you were making it really neat, you would justify the right margin, which mm -hmm. meant you'd put extra spaces in or whatever necessary to bring that right margin yeah. to a straight line which meant you were making it measure up even though it didn't measure up. Uh -huh. And that's what it, it means to be justified by God. It, yeah. He makes us measure up even though we don't. He makes us righteous. Right. Yeah, even with computers, we have uh, the, the ability to justify the left margin 
in, in our word processors, mm -hmm. uh, or justify the right margin, or justify both, both. margins. Yeah. But it means to bring into alignment. Yes. Another yeah. way to think of it is to, uh, you know, a front end alignment of a car. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if one of your wheels is out of alignment a little bit, it pulls, it wears, it rubs, mm -hmm. it, uh, there's a problem. And so uh, you, you have an alignment to bring that one wheel back into exact alignment with the other one. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it is with our rel relationship with God. Right. Uh, so anyway, well, there are two analogies. Yes. We, hope, yeah. we hope that either uh, either the front end of, of an automobile or a word processor right. will, uh, will help with righteousness. Now, it, the phrase is the righteousness of God. And um, the people who, the scholars who study this are a little bit divided about how to understand that. Um, one group, there are actually a number of different ways uh, one group thinks of it as God's own righteousness, the righteousness of God. In other words, God is aligned with his own will perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, others think the righteousness of God means the righteousness that God imparts or declares mm -hmm. uh, for human beings because of the work of Christ. I don't know that we have to decide between those two yeah. because the fact is that, that both things are involved. It's the fullness of the concept. Yeah, right. the, uh, the righteousness that God gives us does flow out of his own righteousness. Exactly. So yeah. I, I'm not sure it's an either or. Yeah. What is absolutely essential, though, to, um, for, for Paul is that this righteousness comes through faith, not works of the law. Right. And it comes through a very specific faith, faith in what God has done in Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, exactly. Yeah. And, and he uses the word redemption. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And, and that's a, a releasing or a freeing or a buying back of where we were not right with God. We, we were estranged from God. Mm -hmm. But Christ has redeemed us, brought us back. Yeah, that word appears in verse 24, and it is very, very important. It, it was a financial term, wasn't it? A, mm -hmm. a money term. Mm -hmm. As you said, buying someone back. Yeah. Uh, if someone had been captured or kidnapped, mm -hmm. you, you pay a ransom mm -hmm. for them. Or if someone had fallen into slavery right. through indebtedness, Indebted slavery. Yeah. you could pay their debt mm -hmm. and, and redeem them mm -hmm. from, from slavery. You know, we think about the pawn shop. You take your watch yeah. or something and, and, and hawk it. Yeah. And then you go to redeem it. You bring right. it back. Now, I'm so old, I can remember S&H Green Stamp Redemption yes. Centers. <laughs> I used to get a kick out of that phrase, Redemption Center. Right. I thought, well, that would be a good name for a church, wouldn't it? <laughs> Part of our, our wedding gift from, from Donna's grandmother uh -huh. were several green stamp books <laughs> that we, we were able take to... take and buy little household <laughs> items. Things with yeah. Them, yeah. So redemption is very important. And this redemption takes place freely. It's a gift from God by his grace. There's another very mm -hmm. important theological term mm -hmm. that we meet here. Um, now verse 25 goes on to describe the redemptive work of God in Christ with yet another term coming out of Old Testament worship. Yes, that sacrifice of atonement. Yeah, the atoning sacrifice and that's a reference mm -hmm. to what took place on the Day of Atonement, Yom, Yom Kippur. Kippur. Mm -hmm. Uh, which occurred uh, in the fall, September, around there. And uh, this was when the high priest uh, took the blood of a goat representing the sins of the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only time of the year that the high priest would go in through the curtain, through the veil, and into the Holy of Holies mm -hmm. and splash that blood onto the mercy seat, mm -hmm. the lid of the, of the Ark. Ark of the Covenant. Right. And so that's what he's referring to there, that old Yom Kippur mm -hmm. um, custom. But it was a high holy day because mm -hmm. it was the, the single day of the year that was no work. It was to be a, a day of consecration before God. And, and the, the sacrifice of atonement was extremely important. Yeah. And now Paul says that that has been accomplished once and for all mm -hmm. by the shedding of Christ's blood whom God presented as his own sacrifice 
of atonement. Right. And of course, uh, the book of Hebrews it's is good. going to pick up on this yes. and explore it in great mm -hmm. detail. That once for all emphasis, especially. Yeah. 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 So, um, so that's another important concept here. So it, this is such a rich passage. Mm -hmm. Righteousness, faith, grace, redemption, atonement. And, of course, uh, the word faith is just sprinkled all the way through here. In the latter part of verse 25, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because it is forbearance. Yeah. He left the sins that's a, committed. That's a good word that we don't use very often of mm -hmm. God. It, it, forbearance suggests his, his hesitation to uh, apply judgment mm -hmm. and punishment. Holding uh, off. Holding off in his grace, mm -hmm. in his mercy. Mm-hmm. Um, in in order to bring about a, a means of rescue, I love what uh, Paul wrote in uh, had already written, I guess, in Galatians. Uh, at just the right time, at the fullness of time, God mm -hmm. sent forth His Son. There had been a long period of forbearance there mm -hmm. until finally conditions were right yeah. for God to enact His saving plan through Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, verse 26 is interesting. It, it uses the word righteousness, just, and justifies, all of which are the same word, actually. Yeah. Um, but it, it says so much about God. God is just by mm -hmm. nature. We talked about the righteousness of God, God's self. Mm -hmm. But God then also justifies those by the work of Christ faith. those yeah. who have faith. So God is just and God justifies. God mm -hmm. is righteous and God makes us righteous. And then he reminds us it's through faith and it's through faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's at the end of 26. And I had a professor in seminary that, that was really <coughs> strong in emphasizing that when we are justified, it's not just that, that God declares us not guilty. Mm -hmm. He makes us not guilty. Mm. He changes our condition. And it's not just a statement that's made that's incorrect. He makes us righteous. Hmm. So the work so. of Christ is not just declaring us innocent in spite of our sin. Right. It's, it's an actual cleansing, cleansing mm -hmm. making, a, making Re us into a right relationship cleansing. with God. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, um, verse 27 brings us to the, the boasting mm -hmm. that might have been going, actually going on between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. It sounds like think? it, yes. Yeah. 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 Jews could have boasted that they'd had the covenant, they'd had the promises, they'd mm -hmm. had the scriptures, they'd had all of this, they'd had the law, they'd had a long, long relationship with God. Mm -hmm. um, Gentiles could have boasted that, yeah, they have a relationship with God and they didn't have all that stuff. What happened to the Jews? <laughs> yeah. You blew it. So yeah. um, uh, I like that uh, the NIV translates, where's the boasting? It is excluded. The actual word that Paul uses there is it's locked out as if, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, there any, is there any room for boasting here? No, boasting has been kicked out of the door. The door has been locked and we threw away the key. Right. There's no place in the Christian life it's emphatic. for boasting. Yeah. Uh, what about the law? Is that a reason for boasting? No, no. because in spite of the law, um, in spite of doing works of the law, in spite of obedience, that could not save. Yeah. It could only point out the need for salvation. And, and Paul stresses that it's a different law now in the sense that it's based on faith, yeah. not works. And the word law there, I think, uh, means something like principle. Mm -hmm. It's standard. Yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. not the law that requires faith. So you don't have to go back and leaf through the Old Testament looking for the law that requires faith. Right. It means we operate on a whole new basis now, yeah. a whole new principle of faith, mm -hmm. not law keeping. Mm -hmm. Verse 28 is a, he's, he's said this many times, but this may be the most succinct summary of Paul's point here in this mm -hmm. paragraph. We maintain, this is our, our principle, a person is justified, that is made right with God by faith, not on the basis of 
law keeping, yeah. works of the law. And we find this coming through his writings. Galatians, as we've already mentioned, Ephesians stresses mm -hmm. this as well. Mm -hmm. he, he's constantly emphasizing that it's not something we can earn our way into heaven mm -hmm. by keeping laws. It's by faith. Yeah. Now we saw a, a reference to Jews and Gentiles way back in chapter 1 in that theme verse that you read, mm -hmm. those, those two verses you read. And in verse 29, he comes back to that. Is God the God of the Jews only? No way. He's God of the Gentiles too. Mm -hmm. Paul had been called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Yes. But in the midst of his call, uh, this is in uh, Acts chapter 9, it says, I call you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the mm -hmm. people of Israel. Yeah. So even when he was called to be an apostle to mm -hmm. the Gentiles, Paul was very clear that part of his mission was to reach out to Gentiles. We'll see that in Jews. a couple of weeks as we look at chapter 11, oh, where he yes. stresses that, yes. uh, you know, I, I still have this heart for my own people. Uh, okay. I'm the apostle All of the right. Gentiles. I won't say so. any more about that now, <laughs> but that's very important. Yeah. Um, now, he, he makes mention here in chapter, th in verse 30, of the outward sign of the covenant that distinguished the Jews from the Gentiles, mm -hmm. this uh, circumcision. Circumcision, yeah. And so he says, um, everyone comes to God on the same basis. Mm -hmm. Circumcision, circum uncircumcision, it doesn't matter. Right. What matters is faith in Jesus it's Christ. It's that same faith. Faith in yeah. Christ. Now, the question would have occurred both to Jews and Gentiles, so was the law a big waste of time? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or do we waste our time? Even looking back at the law, and Paul's answer is what? This is verse 31. <laughs> Do we then nullify the law? Absolutely not. That, yeah. In Greek, that, the book of Romans, Paul has that yeah. phrase, no way. No way, Jose. Yeah, he, uh, exclamation point. The King, the King James translated it, God forbid, yeah. which isn't a literal translation at all, but it does show his horror. But it's, it's yeah, good it's grief, no. Yeah. You know? But it also highlights what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Right. And that's really what Paul's saying here. It is. Well, there's so many wonderful things and concepts in this passage. Oh, it's yes. hard to know where to sum it up. One of the things that jumped out at me this time through was the wonderful things that it says about God. God is just, God mm -hmm. is righteous and relates to us on that basis. And yet God also justifies us, God mm -hmm. makes us righteous, redeems us, forbears with us, shows us grace, demonstrates his own righteousness, and it's all to his glory. We mm -hmm. may fall short of it, but God's work in Christ is so that we could see and share in We his see glory. this through Jesus. And that's, yeah. yeah. Well, we're so glad that you could join us today. We feel like we've only touched the tip of the iceberg in this wonderful passage. It's so rich and deep, but we've made a good start, and thanks for being with us. We'll continue our study in Romans in the weeks to follow. See you next week. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson brought to you as a ministry of First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. Our thanks to our teachers that led us for this week's lesson. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School Lesson Text. This has been a production of First Christian Church.